Dafio Me Week in Lightning Review, where we spend a half hour on Thursday, morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on what time it is for you, um, reviewing what we learned in Talmud in Dafio Me over the last week. We have a wonder, I, I'm Rachel Scheinerman. I edit My Jewish Learning and the Daily Dose of Talmud, Talmud series. And we have, of course, a wonderful cast of teachers who come and learn with us in this space every week. And this morning for me, morning for me, we are joined by Rabbi Lexi Botsam. Lexi, did I say, did I say your last name right? It's Botsam. But it's Botsam. Not like I'm sorry. So much correspondence and so little FaceTime sometimes. Um, thanks for correcting me. All right, go ahead and take it away. All right. Well, it's great to see everybody. Um, I think this is a particularly exciting week of, of Gemara, in, in part because the, the bit that we're going to focus on today really unpacks one of the core concepts that we've been learning the last few weeks in this uh, third chapter of Baba Batra, says Katabatim, right, where we've been dealing with this notion of Chazaka, right? Up until now, we've mostly been dealing with the notion of Chazaka as it pertains to land, Right. And this question of how do you have to interact with or sort of work or demonstrate ownership of different plots of land um, for how long and in what ways to be able to establish a presumptive claim of ownership. Right. So that's what we've been looking at for the last week or two. And this week, you know, we continue the first Mishnah took us for a very long time in this chapter. So we finally finished that up uh, this past week between, you know, the Dafim 37 and 44. Um, and so we deal with a lot of questions like, you know, when you're selling trees, how much land accompanies them? Um, and when things are overcrowded, can you establish Chazaka knowing some of those things will be uprooted, right? Really getting into the nitty gritty of, how can you establish presumptive ownership of something based off of the real physical details of how that plot is usually used? Um, and then we get a new Mishnah, which is about these three different lands for Chazaka, right? Something that really comes up with that Mishnah and the accompanying Gemara is that for Chazaka to be effective, it has to be a scenario where a person could launch an effective protest, right? This whole notion of Chazaka, of being able, your having worked land for some amount of time, being proof of ownership, is based on the notion that if you hadn't legitimately acquired that land, the real owner would have protested at some point, right? They wouldn't just let you sit there and work the land indefinitely. And so the Gemara points out that that presumption only really works if it's a scenario where we can assume that the original owner would know this land is being possessed and worked and would be able to launch an effective protest, right? So the Gemara gets into the question of how far apart can you be for this to still work? Are you able to you know, lodge a protest in the absence of the person who's currently in possession of your land or not? And so we get into some of the nitty gritty of that. Um, and then finally, I wanna focus on some of the material that comes up in the last couple of document of this week where I think we get a fascinating look, again, into the sort of basic nature of what this chazaka is that we've been talking about um, when it comes to presumptive ownership and how that contrasts with another way that the term chazaka is often used. Um, and so I'm going to share my screen and I will share in the chat um, this source sheet. Um, I apologize that at the bottom there is a, an untranslated Miri that um, I it will probably translate at some point later. People are interested in coming back to the source sheet, but we are not going to be doing it inside today. Um, okay. So I just sent that there and I will share my screen. Um, can I share my screen? You should have a green button at the bottom with an arrow that says share. Ah, I just had to expand it. We're good. Okay. Can people see things okay? All right. Wonderful. Can you so, maybe just zoom in a little so you take the whole width and the text becomes a little larger? Yes. Um, that's, that's easier on my yeah. eyes anyway. How's that? Much better, thank you. Wonderful. 
Okay. So we are looking at this Mishnah on the Batra 41A, um, which brings up a really crucial point that it's a bit strange that, you know, 13 Dapim and Dechaz Kadabakim, right? After, after 13 Dapim of talking about this notion of Chazaka, this point is only made really explicit in the Mishnah now about what is necessary for a Chazaka to be functional, right? So the Mishnah says, Kol chazaka she'en imatadna in a chazaka. Any sort of possession, any physical possession that is not accompanied by a claim is not a proper chazaka, is not a proper form of possession. Ketzad, amarlo, ma'ata oseh betoch sheli, v'hu amarlo, shelo amarli adam devar me'olam, e'en no chazaka. Right, so what are we talking about here? If the previous owner of the land um, said, what are you doing in my land? And the person currently on it said, well, nobody ever said anything to me, right? I've been here for a few years and like nobody's said anything about it. That's not an effective chazaka, right? Because they're not making a claim as to how they legitimately acquired it. They're just saying, I squatted here and nobody stopped me from doing so. Therefore, this must be mine. Um, and now on the opposite end, if the person says, you sold it to me, or you gave it to me as a gift, or your father sold it to me, or your father gave it to me as a gift, then that's a chazaka, right? They're saying, I legitimately acquired this land. Um, and you can, you know that I legitimately acquired it because I've been able to exist in it for these last few years, right? And the last point, right? That somebody who is coming because of inheritance, right? Who is coming into land that their father owned, um, they don't need to be able to explain how their father acquired the land, right? There is a debate in the Gemara as to whether they need to be able to prove um, their father uh, lived in the land for a certain period of time. But it's not upon them to point out that like, oh, my father bought it from so-and-so, right? If the father lived in it for a certain amount of time, then you're just inheriting and that's a legitimate claim. Okay. This is our Mishnah here. I, we're, we'll look for a second at the opening Gemara, but my question is, was this obvious to people? I know maybe if people have been following along in the Dafyomi highlights, some people have pointed this out already in the summaries. But the fact that the chazaka we've been talking about is one that can only be accompanied by um, a claim of how you legitimately acquire the land. Is that something that felt obvious to people? Or, or did people interpret this notion differently when we first encountered it? Larry says it's not obvious. I wonder if that's in part because we sometimes use the word squatter in our trans as we were writing about this in the series, which which makes it sound like anybody who's just there can yeah. and, and maybe that was not the best translation choice that we that we made as we wrote this series. Yeah. Yeah. Also viewed it as squatting, right? That like it really you look at just the first Mishnah in Khazkarabatim. Again, obviously, since we're on Sfaria, and Sfaria often adds in, you know, in these non-bolded sections that are not in the text, it often adds in context that comes up later or in the commentaries. But if you don't look at that filled in stuff, then it really just seemed to indicate that, like, yeah, if you're there for a few years, it's yours, right? That's a legitimate claim. Like, Oh, if you spend enough time there, um, then you've acquired it, right? Maybe it would have been always the time, but not now to us. Yeah. Maybe it's one of those things that Susan just said, like, um, that it's possible that this was so obvious to them that initially they didn't feel the need to, to explain it and only now elaborate upon it. But for us, living in a very different material culture, that's not an immediately clear fact, um, right? The Homestead Act, right? So we have this whole notion of, like, um, well, you say you have a, if you have a claim, you don't need chazaka. I think it's important Saul said that. If you have a claim, the reason chazaka would be important, uh, well, I guess I'll open this question. Why 
if you have a claim of you sold this to me, et cetera, would Chazaka be important? Potentially. Lara says the Gemara seemed clear about how long you need to be there. And this new mission is confusing. Yeah. Um, lost documents. Excellent. We're going to get to that in a moment. But basically, the we see Chazak of acquisition, but proof of ownership, right? That if you acquired something, um, and either you lost the documents or theoretically there weren't documents, but it is something you have a legitimate claim of like, no, this person like gave it to me. Um, then the chazaka is a way that you're able to prove that ownership, right? That like, I, I did legitimately get this. And how do you know I legitimately got, got this? The person let me work it for three years because they gave it to me, right? Otherwise I wouldn't have been able to be here for this long. Um, right, someone said adjudicate the claim, exactly. Um, Aaron asked, what if there are witnesses that said it was not sold? If there are witnesses that say it was, I mean, I think it's kind of hard to argue. I think it might be hard to have witnesses to the fact of something not being sold just because, you know, you can have people who say, I know this originally belonged to so-and-so, but it's hard to have witnesses who can say that something was never sold because for all they know, it was just sold at a time that they weren't around. Right, so that's less of a, a common phenomenon. But we are dealing with the case generally where there aren't witnesses to the sale or those witnesses aren't available. Um, okay, so all of this, it's fascinating because right now we've been saying like, no, it was totally not obvious that this is the case based off of the first 13 docking of this chapter. But the Gumara's first response is, Pshita! the Gumara's like, oh, this is totally obvious. Why do we even need to state this? Right? It's completely, completely obvious that this chazaka is only legitimate if accompanied by a claim as to how one acquired the land. So going back to what somebody else said, maybe we are dealing with something about their material reality such that they never even considered that this form of chazaka would be about squat and then you just acquire it. Um, and so to them, you know, it hardly even needs to be stated that this is about proving your ownership, not about, you know, becoming the owner of something. But now they give an answer relating to our lost document question, which is mahu de tema. First of all, this is a really classic formulation. Pshita mahu de tema, right? That the Gemara assumes that the Mishnah is not, it never gives extraneous information. It's never saying things just to say, to say things, right? The Gemara assumes the Mishnah is roughly a perfect document. And so if something seems obvious, there must be something that we're missing. It's teaching us something that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise. So at first it says, this is obvious. Why did we need this? And then, ah, mahu de tema. What would you have said, right? If the Mishnah didn't exist, what might I have mistakenly said without this information? Mahu de tema. Hi, Gabra. Mizban zvinale. Hi, Ara. Ushtar havelei de irkas. Bahai zika amar hachi savar. Iyamena mizban zvinale. Hi, Ara. So I might have said, this guy, who's just saying, oh, nobody ever protested. I was just in the land for a few years and no one ever said anything. I might have thought, well, actually, he did purchase the land and he had a document, but it was lost. And the reason that he just said, oh, no one ever said anything to me is because he figured, well, if I say that they sold it to me, the court will be like, well, show us proof that it was sold. Uh, and I don't have my document. So um, he's basically saying, oh, no one ever protested because he figures if he tells the truth that they'll ask him for proof that he doesn't have. Um, and so I might have thought that what do we say to him? we, the court, offer a claim on his behalf. We say, ah, maybe you had a bill of sale and it was lost, right? Then maybe we would apply the, the pasuk from Proverbs, open your mouth for the mute. But there, this is something that comes up throughout Nazikim. There's a really fascinating concept, which is that there are times where the court makes claims on people's behalf that they themselves don't make. 
right? There are times where the court, and this really is presumably trying to deal with the fact that you have really varying levels of knowledge about the legal system. And there are times where people don't know the claims they could make on their own behalf, right? So there are a lot of scenarios where we do in fact say the court makes the most advantageous claim that could be made for a person because they even know that that's a possibility. So I might've thought that the same is true here, where if I've just, you know, been on land for a few years, someone comes and says it's theirs. And I say, well, no one ever protested the last few years. The court could be like, well, maybe what you mean <laughs> is that you bought it and you lost your document. Um, so Kamash Milan, the Mishnah comes to teach us that is not the case. This is not one of those scenarios where the court advances a claim on my behalf if I don't make it, right? That in this scenario, if all I ever said was no one ever protested, we don't assume anything else unless I change my mind, right? Someone says, it seems like there's no real presumption of ownership, right? Well, so this is a great point. Lynn says, it seems like they need to have some sort of proof that they are legally there. Um, this is where the chazaka really comes in, is that the chazaka is actually considered the proof. What this person didn't realize, right? This person in our envisioned scenario didn't realize that if they had said, I, it was sold to me, but I lost the star, they would be awarded the land, right? It, because their chazaka is considered to be a proof of the fact that they legitimately bought it, right? That in a lot of ways, the chazaka essentially stands in place of a star. Um, and so when it comes down to it, again, this chazaka we've been talking about, it's not a form of acquisition. It's a form of demonstrating that you acquired the land in some other way, right? That it basically stands in place of other forms of documented proof. So if this person had themselves said, I bought the land, I lost the star, but I've been living in it for three years. Clearly I could only be doing that if I legitimately owned it. We would believe them and they would be allowed to keep the land. Right. It's more just that the Gemara is saying um, that if they don't make that claim, if they just say, oh, no one ever protested, um, then we don't make that claim on their behalf. Right. So someone just said, I thought working the land was a proof. Right. Exactly. The point is that being able to work the land for this amount of time is considered to be like a star. Right. That is its own form of proof. Of is that that proof only works if you have a claim as to how you legitimately acquired the land. It can be proof of ownership, not means of acquisition, right? And so that's a really important distinction that we're making here, that this chazaka we've been dealing with the last 13 dapian, it's something, again, that like stands in place of other forms of documentation. It's something that demonstrates that you have a right to the land, but it doesn't create that right. Our assumption is that you've been able to work the land for that long because you legitimately acquired it in some other way. You know, you bought it or it was given to you as a gift, et cetera. And that's why no one protested. Um, we talk about possession being nine tenths of the law, uh, argument sufficient for the land, insufficient for money. Right. So there for now, it's a really important point someone just made that we're talking about land. As we'll see, the, the chapter will get more into questions of metaltaline, of movable property, and the way that chazaka differs with those. In general, chazaka required for land, what is required to sort of demonstrate ownership of land, there's a much higher bar than for metaltaline, than for movable property, right? Which makes sense, I think, on a lot of levels. Um, but it is true that we have sort of different standards of what we assume um, possession of and working of a plot of land means versus like, I have a purse on me. In general, if I have a purse on me and somebody else says it's theirs, but has no proof that it's theirs, like, of course we assume it's mine, right? It's, I'm holding the purse, right? It's something that we saw way back at the beginning of Bab Metzia with Shnaim Ochsin, right? Two people holding the talus, where we say the very fact of someone holding something, a metallic piece of like a movable property is considered itself to be like demonstration of ownership. Um, any squad we're taking to court can just say the land was sold to them. Ah, this is a great question. So someone just said, if if this is really the case that, you know, Chazaka is just proof of ownership, 
then why wouldn't it be that anyone just squats, is taken to court, says the land was sold to them, and they lost the bill of sale? This is something that um, a few of the uh, Rishonim bring up as, as a concern. Basically, there is a, a couple of things that work against this. One of them is we have this notion of low chasif inish, um, that we have a limit to how chutzpahdik we think people are, um, and that in general, there's this notion that people often are not going to make blatantly false claims in front of the person who knows that they're lying, right? That like, I'm not going to go into court with this person whose land I've been squatting on, who fully knows they never sold it to me or gave it to me and be like, what do you mean? You sold it to me. Um, that people generally um, have a limited willingness to be like that chutzpahdik. They like to be a little more subtle in their false claims. Um, and there's also this notion that where the chazaka is coming in is that part of why we're less worried about this like false claim is that we assume that if a person has been able to effectively, you know, squat, that they're living on this land for years, they're working it, that like, if the owner hasn't protested until now, like, there must be a reason, right? Our general assumption is that, like, people don't just let folks squat on and work their land for no reason indefinitely. Um, and so if they were allowed to do it that, that for that long, that's a really strong point to argue for them not, you know, being liars, right? Because otherwise, it's not clear how they've been able to manage the possession for this long. Um, and so let's see, we have, the rabbis do believe in chutzpah, but they think it has its limits. You know, people, there's an interesting thing. We have chutzpah and we have chatzif, which are used very different. It's the same root, right? But it's like really used as like brazenness. They're like people just, especially when it comes to things like court cases, there is a limit to how brazen people will be. Okay. So we've been saying all of this about sort of how the chazaka we've been discussing up until now is proof of ownership. It's not you squat on something and then you acquire it. It's that you acquire something and then your having lived on it is proof that you legitimately acquired it if that's contested. But a Mishnah Adaf later brings a huge important caveat to this whole discussion, right? So this is the Mishnah that started off with the uh, comment about the different artisans and like um, how artisans and partners and husbands and wives can't establish chazaka with regard to each other's property because there is actually a presumption that, for example, you would let an artisan possess your item for a long time without protesting because that's part of what they do, right? Same with a business partner or your husband. The fact of them being able to use it or possess it isn't proof that you gave it to them. It could be that it's yours, but you just let them possess it. But then the Mishnah continues and says this. So, means when is when are these words applicable? And it's important to remember that we're not that far into the Mishnah on this chapter yet, right? And so the way the Mishnah is divided in the Gemara is not necessarily how the Mishnah relates to itself. And so this Bamedri Mamarim seems to be relating to actually the entire previous parak of Mishnah, right? Everything we've been saying up until now in Fez Karabatim about how Chazaka works, what cases are we referring to? We're referring to somebody who simply has possession of a property, right? We're referring to cases of possession being used as proof of ownership. But when somebody is giving a gift or when two brothers are dividing their inheritance or somebody who is taking uh, acquiring the possessions of a convert who died and who does not have heirs, therefore the entire stuff is have care. In those cases, if somebody uh, locked the door of the property or fenced uh, or reached in uh, the fence even a little bit, this is taking possession of the property and it affects acquisition. That is a way of acquiring. Um, and so this is the huge, huge distinction being made. Chazaka is 
also a form of acquisition, but it works in different ways. We use the same term chazaka to mean both presumptive ownership, right? The way that we've been using it the last 13 dafim of, oh, I acquired the land in some other way, right? It was sold to me or I, you know, there's a document exchange and my having lived in it and worked in it is proof that it's mine. And then we also have the notion of chazaka as a form of acquisition. That the Mishnah says land can only be acquired in three ways. Through kesef, shtar, or chazaka. Through money, a document, or chazaka. And so in this case, what we're referring to is that when somebody is like transferring a thing to me, you know, somebody is giving me their land as a gift, right? One way in which I can acquire that land, right? Such that it is now officially mine, we can't go back on this transaction, would be to like fence in the, the surrounding walls. In doing so, this act of sort of demonstrative ownership over it is a way of solidifying that transaction and actually acquiring the land, right? And to be clear, this only works when it's happening, you know, in front of only works. It's not that I can go and breach their fence and be like, ah, I acquired it, right? It's that this is a way of, if somebody says, I'm giving you my land, and then I, you know, prepare the fence. That's a way of solidifying. You have chazaka that is demonstration of ownership, right? Where someone says, you know, I, you know, this land is mine. You're squatting it. And I say, no, you sold it to me. And I can prove that because I've been able to live in it and work it for three years. And then you have the case where someone says, yeah, this land is yours. And the way that I managed to sort of make that acquisition happen is by sort of doing a sort of physical act that demonstrates ownership of the land. So this sort of in some ways compounds our confusion because it turns out that there is a thing called chazaka that is a form of acquiring, right? That is not just proof of ownership, but it is different than what we have been speaking about these past 13 dapim when it comes to the living there for three years or working a certain amount. So that's the sort of proof of ownership model. And then there's a separate thing called chazaka that is when you do a physical act to solidify a transaction that is happening in front of us right now. Okay. Um, it is 9.58. There's a lot of really complicated and fun stuff. So I want to see if anybody has any final questions before we have to close this out. We have a very active chat, but why don't we do it this way? Let me invite people to raise their hands if they'd like to ask a question in the, room, in the waning minutes of this very quick half hour. It always goes fast. Also, somebody mentioned that this land is your land. I think that really applies. There's actually Sugyo and Baba Kama about um, out of Yehoshua about ways that you can use public land that I think uh, are very woody duck for us. Uh, Susan? All right. Got a couple of hands now. Uh, yes. In this new, thank you. In this new, in this new Mishnah, it talks about somebody who takes the possession of the property of a convert who died without heirs. Why is a convert singled out? Why wouldn't it be any Jew? Because, excellent question. So the point is that converts definitionally die without heirs because the Gemara understands that when a person converts, they essentially become a new person. And that in some ways meaningfully severs, at least legally, their relationships to the rest of their family. So certainly if their children are still not Jewish, um, they can't inherit under Jewish law. And all the, and even if their children also converted, but you know their children converted, it's not that they were born after the convert themselves converted. They are not considered to be legally the heirs of the convert. They are considered to be essentially separate people, um, such that the convert 
in, it's one thing if they converted and then later had children, those children are legally their heirs. But if they had children before converting, those children are not under Jewish law, their heirs. And therefore, definitionally, a convert's property is usually going to be half care after they die because they almost never will have heirs. Even if even if the convert's children convert separately, they're still not considered the person's heirs. Yes, unfortunately, there is this notion that like, again, you are sort of severing and then recreating those relationships, but in a way where you are like new people after having converted, such that the familial relationship you had as non-Jews doesn't like transfer over when you both separately convert. Okay, then. Thank you. Um, I think it's very else not intuitive to us that they would think that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I yeah. think one other person had a question, but I don't see the hand and I know it is over time, but um, it was wonderful getting to learn with all of you. And yeah. Thank you, Rabbi Botsam. This is why we just keep going all the time. So if you didn't get a chance to, to ask your question today, bring it back next week. And uh, just bit by bit, right? So it was lovely to see you all. Thank you, Robert Boatsum. I always appreciate learning from you and from all of you. Of course, you ask great questions and offer great comments in the chat. And I always learn things in these sessions. Um, very lucky to have a job where I get to learn all the time. <laughs> so uh, lovely to see you all. We will see you in your inbox tomorrow morning at uh, 5 a.m. Eastern, as we always do, and in this space in exactly one week's time. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Bye-bye.